everybody to this collaboration between Sharjah Documentation and Archives Authority and Mr. Peter Jackson. My name is Hindi Lihiai. It gives me great pleasure to be welcoming you all today and to introduce our speaker who is going to talk to us about Sharjah's architecture. Peter Jackson first came to the UAE working with John R. Harris Architects in the early 1970s. Through a varied career over nearly 50 years, Peter has also worked in the UK, Oman, Jordan, Zambia, Botswana, and Mozambique, of which for 22 years he was in his own architectural partnership in Zimbabwe. He returned to the UAE in 2002, and since 2007 as architect advisor in His Highness the Ruler's office, has been involved with the planning and design of various notable museums and visitor centers in the Emirate of Sharjah. Peter served for many years as historic buildings advisor to the city of Harare and was founding chairman of the English speaking chapter of the UAE Architectural Heritage Society. He has lectured and written numerous articles and published two books, which are Historic Buildings of Harare in 1986 and Wind Tower in 2007, co authored with Dr. Anne Coles. And now I would like to invite our own rebel guest to share his knowledge with us. And if there's any questions or inquiries, kindly reach out via chat or, and our guests will respond at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Hind. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Very nice to see a few of friends online. I can't see anybody other than Hind and myself. It's not possible in one presentation to cover all aspects of Sharjah's urban development and architecture, so I've rather chosen to take four bites of this very large apple, looking at what makes it unique and its individuality that sets it apart from other towns and emirates, including the impact of oil and Halcro's town plans, the, the rulers shaping of Sharjah, and finally making fine contemporary architecture. But first, let's look at the historic town and its architecture. My 1972 views of Al Khan village give a good impression of traditional coastal settlements, simple fishing and pearling villages that had few masonry buildings, being mainly forty and the Sheikh's house. The principal material was a mat palm leaf stitched together, called barasti. There were winter forms, khema or tents with pitched roofs and summer houses. This severe coastal desert environment was dominated by hot, humid summers. The location of settlements was determined by having a safe anchorage within a sheltered creek and the presence of fresh water close to the surface along the shoreline. Sharjah had both these and its early economy was simple based on fishing and pearl harvesting in summer. But this would barely have kept the majority of inhabitants above a, above a subsistence level. Without trade, urban life was not feasible. Resources were scarce with a limited range of local materials to construct buildings, fortifications, mosques and dwellings. Palm logs, arish fronds, uh, coral and sea stones from its creek and shallow tidal lagoons with lime quarried from rocky outcrops or from burnt seashells. And roofing with imported mangrove channels and woven arish mats supporting a masonry slab above. In 1800, Sharjah's estimated population was probably not more than two to 3,000 people. During the early part of the 19th century, with the consolidation of Kawasin power in the region, and from 1814, when the town became the seat of Sheikh Sultan bin Saka I and his followers who came from Rasul Hema and became the center of government, Sharjah grew from a fishing and pearling settlement to a more substantial urban entity with a permanent settled population. It provided a trading link between inland Bedouin and ports along the shores of the Gulf and beyond, trading dried fish and pearls for dates and rice for Basra, cotton and millet from India, sometimes fruit and vegetables from Iran. Following the British attack on the Kawasim fleet and the towns of Ras al Khaimah and Sharjah in December 1819, the town of Sharjah was first recorded by uh, naval surveyors in 1820. It shows the town behind a fortified wall, but states that fortified houses and towers were destroyed during the late expedition. The masonry buildings are shown in red and gray seems to show those built of Arish. 
Oh, sorry. In 1822, a second survey was conducted. Lieutenant Cogan described Sharjah to be a narrow town half a mile long and an eighth of a mile wide, with its defensive walls already reconstructed after the British attack. It had two towers at its prominent corners and a square tower east of the town, which defended its wells. It also shows the small fish fishing village of Leia, uh, not on the 1820 map. Our earliest views of Sharjah uh, is 1823 Houghton's watercolour coastal sketch of Sharjah from the survey that was carried out along the whole uh, Gulf Coast. And this first historic image shows that masonry buildings did not continuously form the creek edge of the town. The patches of brown between likely indicate areas of airy structures. It shows the landmark tower on the sand spit at Leia and uh, a rocky hill at the southern end of the town, a large mosque and a single and double story houses. The undated photograph below taken by an Armenian photographer from the Lebanon is likely to date from the late 19th century and shows the architectural character of the 19th century town as different to the early 20th century images that we have. Towards the left behind the largest mask can be seen Al-Muhlwasa Al Tower at al Hissan. The buildings on the foreshore line the front of the soup and appear to be a mixture of Arish and masonry. This composite map identifies a proliferation of the original locations of round and square defensive towers, the Burj and the Marabba. These operated together with the town wall or sewer against attack and were located at strategic positions outside the town within the sound of gunshot from each other. The round Burj were solely lookouts, that if a raiding party from the desert was spotted, warning shots could be fired from the top. The entrance was halfway up, accessed by a rope. They were defended for a short period only. The rectangular maraba provided shelter for the villagers, workers in the gardens and those outside the town wall, and provided the main defense for the town. Along the town wall, maraba and Burj alternated. A number of higher masonry buildings uh, pre present very solid first floors broken by small window openings and are characteristic of the first home of Sheikh Sultan bin Saka in al Maraja, reported to have been erected at the end of the 18th century and now part of the Sharjah Heritage Museum. These tower houses give the town a much more solid, austere and defensive appearance than that, with, than that which was to develop in the early 20th century with a much lighter first floor architecture of shade verandas and well-ventilated rooms with many large opening windows closer to the imported Persian merchant style. The original fort at Sharjah al Hissan was a fortified residence. That, that was the building that we have just seen. Um, and with the old town that was destroyed and made unusable by the British in their 1819 attack. But records show that in the commencements of 1823, Sheikh Sultan began the erection of a fort, but was informed, informed he must suspend work until instructions of government respecting it could be received. The government in Bombay replied that it was not intended to prevent the erection of forts or buildings on the Arabian coast and the construction of the fort was then completed. And the most interesting feature of al Hissam was al Mahalusa Tower, um, which the name describes the form of the tower by using the traditional word Mahalus, meaning twisted, and its ground floor provided a secure long-term prison. A 1926 photograph from the creek shows wind towers and colonnaded first floors. The architectural character of the town has much developed since the late 19th century. These were undoubtedly, undoubtedly influenced by wealthy immigrant pearl merchants and traders from Linga and inland Bastak in Iran, areas effectively ruled by the Kawasim 
up until the late 19th century and who with the increased centralized government from Tehran and imposition of high customs duties relocated to Dubai and Bahrain at the turn of the 20th century and a number also set up business in Sharjah. Shady and well-ventilated first floor spaces open to the afternoon onshore sea breeze and were better able to provide some relief from the heat and humidity of summer in the lower Gulf. Palgrave estimated the population in 1863 to be between 25,000 and 30,000, probably at a time uh, when the town was at its largest. Uh, this was reinforced by the migration of tribesmen of the Bani Katab and in particular from the Dade central region. Following a power struggle in the family, the subsequent rule of Sheikh Khalid bin Sultan saw a steady decline in the town's fortune and under his son, Zaka bin Khalid, into the early 20th century. The souk followed the edge of the creek and its linear form followed the pattern of other towns along this coast with different sections dedicated to different trades and products. These views uh, by Thessiger from the mid 20th century show the, show the souk as a thriving commercial heart of the city. And the sections had different names, sometimes referring to the ruler who had, who had constructed them, Saka, Mohammed bin Saka, and also included the souk al Dahlan, the souk of darkness, Today, it is all commonly referred to as Souk al-Baha, the sea souk. By the mid 19th century, the souk in Sharjah was the largest and most active trading center in the Southern Arabian Gulf, together with that of Linga facing it on the Persian coast. William Palgrave described its souks as follows. The, shoot, the shops are neat and well built and the whole has an air of solidity and wealth. Instead of Arab warehouses in which goods and owner are alike on the ground level or even a little below it, we find here regular shops with raised seats, counters and shelves, much like the arrangements ordinary in Bombay or Madras. Merchants, chiefly Hindus or Luthians, make great display of Kashmir shawls, Bengal manuf manufactures, Persian arms and jewellery of various kinds, much beyond whatever I could have anticipated in Arabia. Customers too are not wanting. The northern quarter of the town owns a large number of weavers establishments wherein are made the light red cloaks common in Oman, long cotton robes, carpets too, and curtains for domestic use. Goldsmiths and silversmiths ply their patient labor. Blacksmiths are to be met with at all corners. So a really very lively description of a very active commercial center. By 1908, Sharjah's population had re reduced to about 15,000 with a souk of 200 shops. Sheikh Saka alienated his subjects, apparently indifferent to their grievances. And by the time of his death, the creek had much silted up, affecting the size and number of vessels that could use the waterway, while much of the merchant trade relocated to Dubai in early years of the 20th century which was developing to become the principal port on the Trucial coast at Sharjah's expense. Islam dominated the life of the people and is reflected in the forms of the buildings and settlements. The erection of simple mosques as a physical expression of Islamic belief demonstrated strong continuity of built form over a thousand years in the region. Obeyed bin Isa Mosque, built uh, this photographed in around 1960 didn't have a minaret in 1948 minarets were originally not typical along this coast orientated to the qibla it provided a distinctive landmark along the waterfront the minaret was de demolished when the building was restored it was a double story mosque and uh, the upper floor was used in summer and as a madrasa the ground floor contains cast iron columns, which would have been cast in either Birmingham or Glasgow and were ordered catalogues of the type I've shown you there. Uh, these were made for export to the British colonies in India and Africa and carried out as ballast. The first floor features spectacularly exotic 
oriental col columns, which I suspect are from Indonesia. Beit Sakal was the home of the residency agent. Al Sakal means agent. After the, after the appointment was abolished in 1949, the house was sold to Sheikh Mohammed, father of the present ruler, and became the American Mission Hospital. Built around a large courtyard, it has been restored today as an arts center. And the part directly overlooking the creek on three floors, um, and the upper part is where the nurses lived. Um, that is Isa bin Abdul Latif. Um, his father and grandfather also served as residency agents from 1866 and welded immense influence throughout the sheikdoms. A wealthy merchant in his own right, he imported the first motor car to the Trucial States in 1928. I'm going to talk about house form here. From outside, the mainly single story houses were austere. The lanes and passages between them were blank walls, sometimes with series of slightly recessed panels concealing blank wind scoops to ventilate the living rooms. The living and sleeping rooms looked inwards onto courtyards. Beit Abed bin Isa Shamsi, today known as Beit al Nabuda, after the nickname given to the prosperous pearl merchant, displays all these characteristics. Houses were complex or changing organic structures. They expanded around courtyards as extended families that lived there grew. The courtyards were important to, to sustain focus and the privacy of the family, but were also positive modifiers of the climate. Courtyards provide shade and protection from sandstorms. As they heat up during the day, the warm air rises to be replaced by cooler air. This is then trapped in the courtyard from where it seeps into the surrounding rooms, contributing to cooling overnight and in the early morning. Courtyards usually had a fruit tree, such as a loz or Indian almond, and occasionally flowering bushes and herbs. Goats and chickens were kept there. There were shallow wells, useful for washing, but too saline to provide drinking water, which rather came from wells further inland. And arranged around the courtyard were the various suites of the individual nuclear families. A suite might be a long narrow room used for sleeping with or without a veranda for daytime activities. At the end of each room, a washing area often separated as a Beit al Nabuda with fine carved uh, geometrically, geometrically decorated gypsum screens. The enclosed rooms were high, which meant that warm air accumulated above head height and residents would not feel the heat radiated through the roof. Hot air would escape through high level circular holes on the street side or decorative screen ventilators to the courtyard. Undistinguished, often scruffy street facades were relieved by heavy timber entrance doors and the larger and grander main doors might contain a wicket in one leaf and occasionally framed in elaborate porches. Uh, and these were one of the few indications of wealth and status of the owner. This is the, uh, the original porch to Beit Ibrahim al Midfa on the left, and today the same entrance restored to the reception of the recently opened uh, Chedi Beit Hotel. The Majlis was the men's reception room, but before the days of hotels, it also served as a guest room for business colleagues and distant relatives who would be put up. In Sharjah, the Majlis was often on a separate plot from the main house, which is rather different to the Bastakir in Dubai, where the Majlis is always integral with the main house. At Majlis Ibrahim al Midfa, uh, the Majlis opens off a private veranda with an intimate garden shaded by an Indian almond. And the uni unique design of the circular wind tower over the Majlis is based on a minaret of a mosque with decorative tiles imported from India. Wind towers of the type found in the UAE originated in the desert plateau of Iran. 
They make use of differential air pressure to naturally ventilate rooms below. They greatly increase the air circulation to between one and a half to twice the external air velocity above the house. And this airflow increases the convective heat loss from the surface of the human body through evaporation. Wind towers were used to catch the cooling afternoon sea breeze during the summer month. Charger wind towers have their own character, reflecting individual taste of the mason builder, and they're very different to those we see in Dubai. Circular pilasters and projecting cornices are more common in Sharjah. I should also say they weren't used to sleep under at night. Uh, people would rather sleep on the roofs where they were. Uh, they, uh, it was the coolest place at night uh, where heat would radiate to the open sky. In Sharjah and Bahrain, a more local form of wind catcher was a box projecting above the roof, open on one or two sides only, and facing into the prevailing northwesterly sea breeze. We see here one that was before it was restored on the house of Sheikh Amira, wife of Sheikh Sultan bin Zaka. The discovery of oil in the Northern Gulf resulted in Britain reappraising the potential value of the Trucial States due to the potential wealth in hydrocarbon reserves. The remoteness of the, UA, of the then Trucial States was seen to be a hindrance to communications by the British political residents in Bushir, who proposed the construction of an airfield in Sharjah as a stopover for Imperial Airways on the Lom London, Bombay, and eventually Australia route. The British proposal came at a time when the local economy was badly hit by the collapse in value of the pearl following the Great Depression of 1928 and exacerbated by the introduction of Japanese culture pearls. Sheikh Sultan II bin Saka immediately saw the benefits for the employment and revenues and despite some opposition from the family, he signed a civil air agreement. Handley Page uh, HP 42 or a flying banana can be seen here landing at Al Mahatta in the early 1930s. It was one of eight aircraft flown by Imperial Airways carrying 24 passengers in style and comfort at a cruising speed of 95 miles an hour. Al Mahatta Airfield commenced operations in 1932 with a fortified guest house for overnight stops opened in 1933. And the journey from London to Sharjah in those days was partly by rail, uh, partly by air. It was rail to Italy and then flying from Italy. It took five and a half days, cost 186, 168 pounds, which would be equivalent to 185,000 dirhams today. The presence of the airfield provided opportunities for aerial photography of the town. And the photograph at the bottom shows the creek Al Hissan center right, um, and uh, Obeid Al Nabuda Mosque down here on the edge of the creek, and the souk running immediately along the edge of the creek, parallel to the shore. And there is almost uh, an equal mix of Arish buildings to masonry buildings. Al-Mahatta later accommodated the RAF and army base until the British withdrawal in 1971 and the headquarters and it became the headquarters for the Trucial Oman Scouts later to become the Union Defence Force and for many years Sharjah's largest employers were the RAF, the British Army, the Trucial Oman Scouts and BP. Al-Mahatta contributed immensely to Sharjah's importance as well as its economy. And today, the original rest house seen here on the right um, houses Sharjah's Aviation Museum. Sharjah in 1960, the town layout is typical of, is of Islamic settlements along the Arabian coast. It's a response to the harsh desert climate that equally reflects Islamic tradition with the emphasis on the privacy of the family within a community where rich and poor live alongside each other. The lanes are not straight, but they are staggered around the individual plots. Narrow, narrow and irregular lanes afforded shade 
and privacy for women moving between the houses. Alhissen faced the only large open space in the town, originally on its edge, but never permitted to be hemmed in, giving a clear view of visitors arriving from the hinterland and, if necessary, a clear field of fire. The souk lanes largely run parallel to the edge of the creek, where boats were loaded and unloaded, and provided a strong thread linking much of the length of the settlement. Individual houses were mostly detached, separated by narrow alleyways, which funneled the cooling breezes. Where houses were attached, joined to each other, they would be in joint ownership of a family. Um, which had been subdivided or added to to provide separate living areas for married sons. Here, I have superimposed the 1820, 1822 plan of the town over the survey carried out in 1963. Over 150 years, the urban extent had increased in area, but its traditional form remained largely the same. The town continued to exist on the same economic basis of fishing and trade, with people living in similar, to those, in similar houses to those a century earlier. And Codry's photograph below, taken from inland, shows the important large masonry houses and their roof terraces, and some with wind towers, but in the foreground, a dense mix of Arish buildings of different summer and winter styles including Baluchi domes and Tigris vaults. When oil was found in Abu Dhabi in 1960, Sharjah town's population was around 20,000, but occupied not much bigger area than when described by Lorimer in 1908. One night in 1960, a strong shamal whipped up the waves and blocked the mouth of Sharjah's Creek with sand. In 1963, at the instruction of the then ruler, Sheikh Saka, uh, Sir William Halperin and partners surveyed Matt Sharjah in preparation for the first town plan. And the discovery of oil heralded an unprecedented, unprecedented rate of change in all aspects of society and development. First, Existing buildings were evaluated and categorized as being of special importance uh, or permanent construction in good condition, permanent construction in poor condition and veracity dwellings. And the latter in yellow, you can see occupied a very fair area of the town. The plan was then prepared under the direction of architect Edward Mansfield of Halcro. And it shows the beginning of land use zoning and identified plots for individual ownership for residential suburbs, sites for schools, clinics, hospitals, and neighborhood shopping centers to serve the new suburbs were identified. And the first major engineering project in Sharjah commenced in 1966, being the construction of Aruba Road, linking south to Dubai and north to Ras al Khaimah. And uh, that is the road here. And, um, and a four kilometer stretch of road was built linking Sharjah to the small fishing village of Al Khan um, off to the left. An administrative municipality, Belladia, began its life as an informal body between 1924 and 27. It was one of the earliest municipalities in the Gulf. In 1971, with Sharjah's population now at 35,000, this was established, formally established by a Miri decree and made responsible for impl implementation of the much more expensive, extensive uh, 1969 master plan by Halcrown Partners. This was based on the zoning of land uses for future development. Um, and its objective was to define as closely as possible the expected growth of the town and to highlight problems that exist at present and to offer solutions and principles that could be adopted in order to maintain a balanced initial growth. Developed out of Mansfield's 1963 town plan, the city would be divided into eight land use zones, dissected by rectangular road grid with deviations to suit the irregular profiles of the subca flats 
um, which would eventually become Sharjah's lagoons. The older parts of the town were de designated as mixed residential and commercial areas, but the plan suggested their wide scale redevelopment. This grid road network totally dominated and continu to, continues to dominate the planning of Sharjah. The construction of hard surface roads together with the introduction of reliable electricity and pipe water supplies facilitated and accelerated urban, urban growth and the development of a modern city. In 1960, the sand spit you can see is blocked at the right hand side to the sea where it is silted up. Um, it is beginning to be infilled to provide additional space for the city center to grow and it's been on the left-hand side, it was breached. Um, and the creek was uh, intended really to, to disappear altogether. Um, on the far left, you can see BP's depot and there is a, a jetty here, which was a deep, formed a deep water anchorage and close to it was also a buoy from which fuel could be unloaded directly and pumped to the pumped uh, on shore. Economic change was accompanied by political change. In 1968, Britain determined that its troops would be withdrawn from the trucial states to reduce defense expenditure. A series of long and difficult negotiations took place between the various Trucial shapedoms, but led on the 2nd of December 1971 to the establishment of a federal government and the birth of the United Arab Emirates 50 years ago this year. Here we see the city as a building site. No, we don't. Uh, sorry. 1977 saw the dredging and forming of Khalid Lagoon. With the extensive development of the industrial areas, as development of the port facilities uh, facilitates Sharjah to become the dominant industrial producer in the Emirates in those days. The new, new airport you can see on the horizon um, and the old, Mal old Al Mahatta runway uh, was being absorbed into the town grid. And here center, you can see the development of Burj Avenue Bank Street and the towers that formed the first commercial, modern commercial street of the town. Here we see the city as a building site, Alwada Street in the mid 1970s. The original landscaped palm lined medium today um, has been long lost to road widening. The development of the town's roads generated land for redevelopment, and these were imported, important and constructed as fast as funds permitted, because without a large oil revenue, the raising of funds through the sale of land was critical to Sharjah's economy. So the road reserve widths were kept tight, maxing, maximizing the amount of land available for development. And we can see here the urban impact of typical late 1960s, 70s, medium rise, modern concrete frame development, so characteristic across the old city center. In 1972, Sharjah finally struck oil in commercial quantities in its offshore Mubarak field. And in 1980, a large natural gas field was discovered at Sajjah inland. Revenues gave impetus to major economic development and radical changes in the physical form and extent of the town. Because of the sheer size of our subject in this presentation, I've rather omitted any detailed review of the early commercial architecture of the modern city. Um, and this is currently being researched uh, by uh, Sheikh Sultan bin Sood, and uh, um, hopefully there will soon be um, a publication on it. Um, so I've rather um, focused on the transition from the traditional multi-use urban form um, of the modern single use zone grid planning and the styling of Sharjah's architecture that makes it the distinctive city and emirate that it is today. Hal Crow's 1986 master plan 
provided for the expansion of the city along its grid of distributor roads as far as a new airport. At this time, University City was not yet conceived. And this is the same plan that informs the layout of the greater city of Sharjah today. In January 1972, the then ruler, Sheikh Khalid bin Mohammed, was tragically killed in an unsuccessful coup to be succeeded by his brother, the current ruler, Sheikh Sultan uh, bin Mohammed al Qasimi. And one of the first tasks that Sheikh Sultan undertook was to have the old creek dredged and for it to be reopened to the sea, much to the great pleasure of the townspeople. The development of Port Khalid as a large 12 berth facility began in 1974 under the direction of Sheikh Sultan. Six berths were originally planned, but uh, when uh, it was complete in the in mid to the late 1975, the ruler instructed its expansion and uh, added a further three. Uh, and to recreate the creek entrance and the soup basin. This was all completed in 1978. It also provided the opportunity for an area of reclaimed land next to the port for a new steam power station at Leia. And the, this was completed, this was started in 1975 and expanded in phases up to 2007. The city of Sharjah inherited a complex area of floodplains, Sapka floodplains, salt flats. Um, now fully dredged, they provide the central business district with 25 kilometers of inland waterfront, one of the finest assets a city might wish for. Khalid Lagoon was dredged and given its present form by the late 1970s. Mamza and Al Lagoon followed and were completed in 1993. The central or blue soup was designed by the British architects Michael Lyle and partners, completed in 1978. Here we can see the hand of His Highness in the design. Exuberant vaults and bridges were marked by strong patterns of blue tiling, with a unique skyline of wind towers running along the top of each vault. The central vaulted man was ve mal was ventilated solely by its wind towers, but these didn't follow the principles required to make a wind tower work other than, than as a ventilator. So in 2004, it was finally fully air conditioned. The exuberant architecture, decoration and tiling are really very very lovely and circular motifs on the ends uh, are uh, tiled Quranic exhortations for the shop owners not to cheat customers. The building was and remains a great landmark, uh, quite different from a shopping mall and it captures the character of the bazaar on a grand scale. It's in a dramatic location fronting Khaled Lagoon. Sharjah Airport was inaugurated in January 1977 for freight traffic and open for passenger services in April 1979. Again, the architect was Edward Mansfield, who followed the conceptual sketch by His Highness the Ruler, and that's the ruler's sketch top left, and it's been altered and extended since 2009 but the central domed hall offers a contemporary landmark through the use of traditional forms and offers an interior that is human scaled and welcoming. Another building designed by architect Mansfield of Halpro working with his highness is a 200 meter long Al Majara souk, uh, which was uh, a, I think uh, completed in the mid 1990s, sorry, the, the late 80, 1980s. Um, the ruler kept control of the design throughout its development. His original inspiration was from a print of one of the gates into Istanbul and Waterhouse's exuberant Victorian Revival Natural History Museum in South Kensington. A special factory was set up in Sharjah for the colored precast stone re required to match the South Kensington Museum. Um, this factory was subsequently taken over by Emirates Stone, 
who have been responsible ever since for the fabrication of many neoclassical facades on the government buildings. Al Majar Souq closed in 2004 and reopened in 2008 the Sharjah Museum of Islamic Civilization. The Faisal Mosque in Al Sur was designed and built by the Saudis in the early 1980s at one end of the old runway. It's a striking blend of traditional and contemporary forms. The architect Abdul Rahman Abdul Hafid Al Junaidi from Technical Office for Architecture and Engineering Consultancy was based in Riyadh. The mosque was inaugurated in January 1987 after two years in construction. Its minarets are 70 meters high and sit above a mosque where 16,000 people can pray inside. During the 1990s, the ruler implemented a major new initiative reflecting Sharjah's leadership in education in the region. And in 1998, the first phase of University City uh, was opened, having been completed in a record 11 months from the first bulldozer to the first intake of students. Planning was undertaken by the French consultants Gombert and the design of the individual buildings was by the Architectural Academic Office. This grand landscape central boulevard dominates, culminates at the American University of Sharjah to create a sense of a great ivory tower of learning. The co-educational co American University is located at the highest part of the university city around a singular central main square which is in contrast to the required duality that pervades the planning of the University of Sharjah adjacent, where male and female facilities uh, are required separately. The eclectic styles of the university are hard to fix against any particular Islamic period, but it's rather a free interpretation of elements drawn from India, the Maghreb and Egypt. The cultural palace, and uh, at the Quran roundabout um, is typical of style of government office buildings, which can be seen throughout Sharjah. And these styles dominate our government architecture and strongly color the character of the city, marking its main squares and public spaces. And Sharjah and Dubai may only be a few miles apart, but there are strong differences between them, which are quite apparent. Sharjah's urban architectural character is born of Arabia and Islamic culture, adapting Western building types and functions within a distinctively Islamic style. The Magfra Mosque on the Corniche Creek in 2002 was built in memory of the ruler's late son, Sheikh Mohammed bin Sultan. It's one of Sharjah's many beautiful mosques was designed by architect Mahmoud Ali Khalifa and the Moroccan tripartite porticos and tile cornices combined with Egyptian banding and a webbed golden mogul dome and minarets. And located next to the entrance of the creek into the Gulf, it provides a very beautiful landmark terminating the Corniche. al Kasbah opened in 1998 in a classical arrangement with two parallel blocks of shops and offices facing each other across Kanat al Kasbah, which is a canal linking Khaled and Al Khan lagoons, and which was constructed to flush the lagoon system. The uppermost two floors of the buildings have paired Moroccan horseshoe windows below a crow step parapet, all sitting above a two storied arched arcade, and the composition is softened by luxuriant landscape which creates one of the city's most charming and popular evening family venues. Another important educational project that opened in 2016 was the Casimir University complex with its particularly grand mosque located immediately to the west of University City and also designed by Architectural Academic Office. Parks and public space form an intrinsic part of the city. The ruler's vision is to provide extensive public gardens to compensate flat dwellers for their separation from the ground. Lawns and palms along the Corniche offer shade and outside space for relaxation. 
And the Corniche is extremely popular and very well used, especially at weekends, Ramadan evenings and at Eid. The rerouting of the Corniche Road here enabled Al Majaz Park to link directly to Khaled Lagoon with much increased amenity, restaurants and fountains. The Department of Culture and Information on the Creek is a particularly handsome building by architect Mahmoud Ali, the last in a handsome series of government buildings that line the Layer Creek waterfront. Sharjah's new meat, fish, fruit and vegetable market at Al Jubail opposite um, was completed in 2017 to the designs by Godwin Austin Johnson. And situated on the seaward side of Alaruba Street, it provides a lively counterpoint to the Blue Sea, which you saw earlier, um, which is on the other side of the bridges that separate the creek from the Khaled Lagoon. So it creates a very nice symmetry. The new headquarters building of Sharjah's Belladia, our municipality, is a beautiful building in Andalusian style with a handsome portico and some very fine Islamic details in marble and ceramic tiling and was designed by the office of Carlos Marinas and was formally inaugurated in 2015. Completed last year, in, sorry, in 2019, the new Sharjah Mosque and Park are designed in an, in an Ottoman style and accommodate more than 5,000 worshippers in the main indoor hall and uh, 600 women in a dedicated female pavilion and 20,000 more worshippers can be accommodated outside. With its two minarets, the mosque can be seen from kilometers away from the Emirates Road or the Malaya Road. It was designed by Hesser Architecture from Turkey with ATI consultants in Dubai. And it has two large semi-shaded courtyards, one on either side, indoor and outdoor ablution areas, a museum, and a very extensive Islamic garden and three-level water cascade, multiple garden kiosks, and a drinking fountain. There are many, many more examples of classically dressed government buildings at the university and around city squares, but what I've shown you, I hope, is sufficient to give you a sense of their range, variety and interconnectedness, which strongly define the urban character of Sharjah. Despite modernization of the city, uh, Dr. Sheikh Sultan is a very active historian with a love for the past as much as a concern for the future development of the city, its services, social infrastructure, and welfare, welfare of its people. And from 1990 onwards, the ruler determined that the historic core of the city must be retained. And over the last 30 years, he has undertaken an extensive program of restoration and reconstruction, particularly, particularly of Al Hissan and important family houses which today house important museums and galleries, a souk and a hotel. The late 1970s saw the development of Sharjah's first multi-storey line main business street, Burj Avenue. Most of Al Hissan was unfortunately demolished. Souk Shinasiya would be demolished to make way for the construction of a new tar road which there, thereafter split the historic town to the, on the left, uh, sorry, on the right between Al Moraja, um, which would become the heritage area, and on the left, Shuehi, which would become the arts area. The land immediately seawards of the souk was reclaimed for a new major road for high rise development between the souk and the relocated Creek Wharf. And that high rise development is now currently being demolished to make way for a new park. In 2009, the ruler instructed the covering of Souk Saka and to enclose it with gates that he remembered as a child. Our objective was to restore the historic continuity of the Souk as a key element that cemented the historic settlement. At that time, the souk was covered by a dilapidated mix of traditional Arish and corrugated iron sheets supported on posts and strung with electrical and telephone wires. 
a careful measured survey was undertaken, exposing the foundations and floors of former shops and carefully recording the elevations of the shop that remained in private ownership. A new roof design was prepared so that the upgrading should not only improve the environment and appearance of the soup, but also its commercial viability. We were concerned to intervene sensitively and not introduce a conflicting architecture or damage the existing historic fabric. Sorry, let me go back. As much as the latter had evolved from traditional timber shuttered fronts to modern glass and aluminium with electric signs, the original fabric of the shops behind still remains largely intact, coral stone and lime mortar, and it provides significant historic continuity and function. The roof itself is constructed independently of the private shop structures on either side as a prefabricated steel column structure supporting a double roof. An arish ceiling was laid a metre below a curved and insulated al aluminium sheeted roof on mangrove chandles spanning the steel frame, maintaining a strong traditional appearance below. The steel frames above were left open to enable cooling breezes to flow between the two surfaces and ceiling fans provide additional airflow in the summer to counter humidity and improve comfort. And it is, it's comfortable throughout, although it's not air conditioned, it's comfortable year round. In January 2012, the archaeology department of Southampton University undertook a geophysical survey of Bank Street between Al Hisson Fort and the reclaimed Corniche and this showed there might be significant remains of original walls and buildings. A six month archeological excavation followed, which you can see in the foreground. Uh, with the Japanese team, Professor Tatsuo Sasaki and his wife, Professor Hanai Sasaki. And now we're beginning to understand more of Sharjah's early development. What was interesting is that although very centrally, centrally located within the 1820s walled town, the stone foundations of the souk and the nearby houses uncovered only date back to the beginning of the 20th century. But there were many, many post holes. So in this part of the town during the 19th century, all the houses were Arish. That is part of the uh, town, uh, part, the part of the souk that we had completed up until that point. The ruler then instructed that the newly exposed souk be reconstructed and a section of the original sea wall and souk foundations were left exposed within a permanent display and explanation of its archaeology and finds. And this new section completes this, the link between the former heritage and arts areas where pedestrian, pedestrians crossing Bank Street have full right of way and with coffee shops, restaurants and gift shops and a small creek facing park. Close by, the, che, the Chedi Bait Hotel, which was uh, recently completed by Godwin Austin Johnson for Sharuk, is now a five star luxury boutique hotel. It's a combination of a group of former merchant houses with some modern extensions. The original houses were in various states of repair, some more or less intact. A couple were collapsed and just courtyard shells, but the group as a whole is very important, containing the old customs house, the post office, and the house and majlis of Ibrahim bin Muhammad al Midfa, who was an important writer and journalist and secretary advisor to the ruler during the 1930s and 40s. The adaptation of the former homes provides sumptuously luxurious spaces internally and externally. My disappoint was, disappointment was that the Al Madfa Midfa Majlis with its circular minaret like wind tower could not be retained as a working wind tower museum. This section, the last section, I'd really like to look at a handful of recent buildings completed in the last few years, which unlike the more traditional architectures that we've been looking at, here Sharjah celebrates the contemporary and looks forward towards the future. In what, in my view, 
is state-of-the-art architecture of very high quality. Well, these are not all in Sharjah City. They represent Sharjah spreading its new projects throughout the Emirate and showing its continued strong focus on art, history, environment and education and learning. The Sharjah Arts Foundation Art Spaces. Uh, the first, this is the first phase of a, a more extensive project. Um, and it, uh, it's beautifully architected contemporary arts buildings were completed for the Sharjah Arts Foundation and the Sharjah Biennale and were designed by Mona al Musfi and Godwin Austin Johnson architects. Um, it consists of a series of contemporary pavilions tracing the footprints of the traditional houses in the area in a very contemporary language, but entirely sympathetic to the historic content, context. The Sharjah Art Foundation wanted to invest non -museum, in non-museum spaces and museum spaces and simultaneously rec reclaim historic links to the city centre. The five dilapidated in buildings in the Al Moraja neighborhood within the historic heart of the city, city offered the perfect urban and architectural setting for this contemporary art venue. And combined with additional outdoor exhibition areas and performance areas, um, the five buildings provide a, a wide range of interior and exterior spaces. The rooftops were interconnected and made accessible and particular attention was given to natural lighting. The art spaces allowed for the preservation of almost 40% of the original urban fabric while creating a new and entirely contemporary gathering, gathering place for local and international artists. And to my mind, offers a beautiful model for the future development of the heart of Sharjah, inserting contemporary architecture into the fragile historic fabric of the town, providing a completely harmonious and seamless blend between old and new. The Malaya Archaeology Center by Daba Architects for the Sharjah Archaeology Authority. The geometry and form of this unusual building were carefully generated around a 4,000 year old Amman Nar Bronze Age tomb at its center. This provides a rich experience and approach to the tomb as well as to the building in a dramatic setting against the long limestone ridge that stretches from Malaya's fossil rock in the north south to Jebel Behais, and which divides Sharjah's western sandy desert from the gravel washout Madame Plain. The structure subtly grows out of the ground, organically in a spiraling ramp that allows visitors, visitors to walk up and view the tomb and the surroundings from a roof terrace. And through a series of concentric sand, sandstone wall, the building spirals and blends into the red sands. Internally, its fluid layout is between the cur curved walls and guide the visitor through a structured exhibition. The landscape close to Fossil Rock offers wonderful changes of light and color to which the sandstone clad building responds. And the result is an elegant design that is sensitive to its environment and archeological setting. The Haste Geology Park by Simon Fraser of Hopkins Architects offers some of the most unusual architecture in the UAE. Um, recently it was likened to a Mars or a moon station. The spherical forms are reminiscent of fossil echinoids found in the sedimentary layers of seabed that formed above the exposures of the Earth's mantle, which were pushed up by the movement between two tectonic plates, one above the other over 90 million years ago. And much of the project is a path to be walked around and among rocks and fossil form formations to explain the very special geology that can be seen in this region. It's one of the very few places in the world where the Earth's mantle is exposed. Most of it is below the sea. Five precast concrete pods are each supported centrally to give a sense of touching the Earth gently, clad with copper colored overlapping metallic scales. They contain a field museum, provide a movie theater and museum displays of rocks and fossils for school children and visitors to gain an understanding of how our central area landscape came to be as it is and explain its dramatic features and their importance. 
The interior of each of the pods is also dramatically cavernous, suitable to the scale of the exhibit and centrally indirectly daylit. An open air classroom is located immediately below the cliff face and there are also important Bronze Age tombs, which provide a link between geological time in millions of years and human archaeology in thousands of years. Sharjah Islamic Botanic Garden at the Environmental Protected Areas Authority's Desert Park, opened in 2014 as part of Sharjah's program celebrating Sharjah becoming Islamic cultural capital of the Arab region. Uh, we were nominated by the Islamic uh, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, ISESCA. Myself in the ruler's office was the design architect, assisted by URS engineers working to a plan drawn by the ruler. It was designed and built in just four months as a contemporary interpretation of the traditional Islamic arch. And the glazed arms of the building frame a series of garden spaces which enables them to be visited throughout the summer. The garden and exhibition are intended to communicate the scientific, medicinal and religious significance of the 50 plants and trees that are referred to in the Holy Quran and the Hadith. EPAAs were the client as well for the Wasit Wetland Center by ex-architects who won a prestigious Aga Khan Award in 2019. The project had been part of the ruler's vision uh, since um, in the early 2000s uh, to transform a former derelict and polluted wasteland along the border with Ajman into a reserve for resident and migrating birds. Here I will quote from the jury citation, which considered that the project stands out as a unique collaborative project combining architectural excellence with a deep commitment to ecological imperatives. It also achieves highly commendable educational and recreational purposes. Perhaps some of the most striking and exemplary aspects of the project are, be, are to be found in its most unconventional virtues. Architecturally, it is intent on disappearing from sight. It merges into the natural environment in ways that respect the site's integrity a wonderful way of reminding us that architectural merit resides more and more on a structure's capacity to blend into an environment rather than to challenge it. Likewise, the project's major contribution to its urban environment is in its reclamation of former wasteland by diverting it from the temptations of real estate development and giving it value as a form of natural capital. In doing so, the project sets a powerful precedent that encourages low impact and environmentally conscious development in a region known for its propensity to go in the opposite direction. The Aga Khan Award is one of the most prestigious architectural awards uh, in the world. The Flying Saucer was originally built on a roundabout in 1976 in Dasman suburb. It was initially conceived as a French inspired store with a restaurant newsstand, tobacconist, gift shop and delicatessen, and later taken over by a local supermarket chain. By the time that the Sharjah Arts Foundation took it over, it had been much altered and spoiled by cladding in aluminium and used as a fast food outlet. Over a few years, the architect Mona al Musfi of Space Continuum has stripped the building, removing ceilings and petitions to fully re reveal its crisp brutalist geometry and transformed it into a unique exhibition space, complemented by a basement meeting area, coffee bar and bookshop daylit through a circular courtyard. No longer a roundabout, the dramatic domed and V-shaped geom geometry complements and provides a strong juxtaposition to the flyover that now provides its backdrop. It positively enriches this corner of the city and once again provides a striking landmark that was originally intended as well as a charming local meeting point. Foster and Partners have just completed Beit al Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, as a project to celebrate Sharjah becoming the 2019 world capital of books. The building is a library, but a library of the future. 
It provides social and study spaces, physical and virtually accessible books between cafe and coffee bar, print to order book production, 3D printing and training, and a reading area for kids and study pods for students. The four square, four square structural cores are squarely planned around a central landscape courtyard and support a wide cantilever roof, shading transparent glass walls, which in turn are screened by simple but effective aluminium shrabia with bamboo folding shutters internally at ground level. It's a very light and unassuming architecture, formal in a classical simplicity from the outside, but subtle and friendly within. I really recommend it's a must to visit and uh, a very beautiful building. Finally, in February 2019, I was privileged to join His Highness the Ruler at the Royal Institute of British Architects in London, where he received an honorary fellowship for the substantial contribution he has made to architecture. Since becoming ruler, Sheikh Sultan has shaped and distinguished Sharjah with its own individual architectural character. He's been a strong advocate for preserving cultural heritage and traditional vernacular architecture to an extent unparalleled in other Gulf cities. He has ensured that the historic cause of its towns be retained and revitalized, and most importantly, striven to balance Islamic tradition with contemporary function and development. Accommodating and celebrating cultural diversity and modernity, he's commissioned a strong and distinctive body of work all over the Emirate. As a result, Sharjah has maintained a powerful cultural identity within the region. In 1998, was selected by UNESCO capital of the Arab world, and in 2014, by the Organization of Islamic Countries as capital of Islamic culture, both titles of which Sharjah can be justly proud. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. All right. Uh, there is a question from Hamad al -Mutawa. He says, uh, what made charges for Jews different than the ones in Dubai? Oh, they were just different families of builders and they have just have their own architectural style. Um, combinations of circular columns uh, and quite a few of them have um, a, a different type of cornice uh, projecting at the top. Um, I think uh, it was one of the places where the Mason architects could express their individuality. So um, that's, uh, that's what we see, uh, just a, a different style. Of course, the very beautiful one is the uh, Almidfa wind tower, the circular one, which is certainly one of the loveliest wind towers in the UAE. Uh, there's an, another question from David Conley. Uh, he says, uh, in Rack, where we have been working, we see the same layout of mixed stones buildings and Arish and historic photographs into the 1960s. However, it is clear that Arish compounds eventually di disappear in towns. When does Peter fear this happens? And more importantly, what caused this change? Well, one of the problems, of course, with the Arish was that it's very vulnerable to fire. Um, and uh, fire, there were fires, very bad fires. People were injured and, and died. Um, in, and certainly uh, we've got records of fires in du Dubai's Bastikir, we've got records of fires in Sharjah, um, and they spread very fast and people just lost their homes overnight. Um, so uh, once, you know, into the 1960s, they were quite quickly replaced by uh, concrete block buildings, concrete brick buildings. Um, and when I was here in the early 1970s, there were a lot of Irish settlements, uh, but most of the Irish buildings in the, in the town centres had disappeared. Uh, but the suburbs, there were large Irish settlements uh, still. Um, and I think they, they were phased out during the late 1970s. Abdesam says, uh, can you please tell us what are the main things that helped develop Sharjah urban planning in the era between 1968 to 1975? Um, which I try to outline, I think the, in the uh, development of an infrastructure, not only the roads, but water, electricity, were really important. Um, uh, obviously, uh, a rectangular planning grid 
is one of the easiest ways of delivering that. Um, obviously, that in the that breaks down when it comes to the edge of the lagoons and the irregular the, uh, around the creek, the irregularities of the coastline. Uh, I think one of the things that was really important by establishing those roads and that service infrastructure was that it enabled land to be subdivided and, and, and sold. Um, and that, and as I said, that was, that was a very important part of Sharjah's income um, was the sale of land uh, during that period. And, you know, until we had um, our small oil fields and, and gas, gas fields. So that, that planning infrastructure was very, was very important. And of course, you know, it's, it's now the backbone of the city we have today. There's another question from Sultan Saud Al Qasimi. He says, he asked, uh, can Sharjah be considered as one town or several towns lying in a close proximity, Al Khan, Hira, Asif, and inner settlements? I ask this because some people look at Dubai as two towns separated by a creek, Dera and Bar Dubai, that later merged. Also, bonus question What is your favorite building in Sharjah in terms of architecture? I think that. Certainly, when you look at the planning, the early, the early planned town in the 80s and possibly into the 90s, um, the, uh, the suburbs probably had, were, were, could still be identified. I, certainly by the, then in the 90s, they were all blending into one another. When I first visited Al Khan in the 70s, you know, it, was, it was quite a long way out of Sharjah. You know, it's now, now just a part of, uh, part of Sharjah. Uh, in a city, um, and they, you know, there's the sub the suburbs. There's no difference between the the old suburbs like Hira uh, and the new suburbs uh, that have been created in the 80s and 90s. You can't tell that you can't tell the difference. The, the road grid has dominated them. Uh, in terms of a favourite building, um, I think. Difficult. I have two or three, but I probably of, of all of them, I, I I just love the flying saucer. I just think it's such a crazy little building. It makes one smile. Uh, there's another question from uh, uh, Habas Al Muallim. Uh, he asked, "What is your advice to current architecture students to continue serving in the vision of His Highness Dr. Sultan Al Qasimi for contemporary and future Islamic and Emirati architecture? Love for the past and concern for the future." I think that it's. I think what the ruler has been very sensitive about is context. He's really he's recognised the importance of context, um, and I don't know how much. I can't speak for him how he, how he saw the impact that this, this government style of architecture um, would have on the, on the character of the city. But it's clearly, it's, it's, it's worked. It's given Sharjah its very distinct identity. And I think that certainly um, young architects very often want to express and they want, their, want to express their own individual, individuality, their own artistic creativity, but I don't think that's really what architecture is about. I think architecture is being sensitive to your neighbors, being sensitive to the context. Um, you saw, you, you heard that um, the jury report on ex-architects, uh, uh, was it wetlands, and said basically the architecture disappears. And certainly, you know, the work that I've been involved in with the consultants I've, I've worked with uh, for the environmental projects and the visitor centers, which are you always in very sensitive environments, whether it's Jebel Bahais or the Kalba mangroves. Um, you know, you've got to be really, you, you really want the architecture, you know, it's got to blend in its surroundings, be appropriate. Um, and some building, a building I didn't show, the Hafir was uh, the Hafir, a wildlife center. You know, the idea was to make the building as invisible as possible, be aware of the entrance and the exit. The rest of it, you know, you should be aware of the environment that you're exploring. Um, in a more in the urban context, um, again, I just I I would moan as lovely uh, spaces for Sharjah Arts Foundation in Al Moraja, 
you know, there's a really wonderful um, blending of contemporary and traditional, a real under, good understanding of human scale. Um, the buildings are not arrogant. You know, you can look at some of the, the, the masterpieces, if you like, in inverted commas, you know, where the architect, architecture shouts, look at me. The new BR headquarters is like that. You know, it, it, um, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, a fine building when it's finished, but it is, you know, it's a lot, a lot of that type of architecture is um, shouts out to be seen um, instead of you. So you don't look at the neighbor, you look at it. Um, Dubai has got a great deal of that architecture, all the tower, each tower vying with its neighbors to be, you know, to be the, the landmark. I don't, good urban design is, is about, uh, if you look at the old Georgian streets of London and Bath, you know, the, the buildings don't stand out. You highlight s squares and corners and so on, but you're very respectful of your neighbours and, you know, it's very nice to see that in, there's a lot of that in Sharjah. Thank you, Peter. There's another question from Sultan Madad. He says, uh, he have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, is there any changes in wind tower when it came from Iran in, air, in early 19, the 1900s, or is it still the same according to architecture? The second question is, you mentioned Sharjah Grand Mosque Ottoman architecture. Can we say it is also the reflection of Byzantine architecture? That's the first question first. Uh, the wind towers, originated on the high Iranian plateau around Yazd, we believe. Some of the oldest and biggest wind towers are in that area. Unfortunately, I haven't seen them. Uh, they then spread down to the coast and the four-sided wind tower, which is what we have generally, um, is seemed to work very well because it's, um, if it was orientated uh, correctly to the, to the prevailing sea breeze. Uh, and that, that's the wind tower that then came across here in the early 20th century uh, and, and similarly to Bahrain and so, and, and so on. Um, and, but in different, different climates, different types of wind towers work. Um, in Baghdad, you know, there, there are wind towers on the houses, but they're very different. They're one-sided. Uh, they were one-sided uh, wind scoops in, in uh, Cairo. Uh, so it depends really what the pattern of the winds are, um, how humid and, and so on. Again, houses in Iran in the dry desert, they combine evaporative cooling and, and water channels below the house to create cool air. Um, ours are more simple. And because of our very high humidity, evaporative cooling is not, doesn't have the same benefit to the, to the same extent. Um, and the second question about the new Sharjah Mosque, and the Ottoman style, uh, it's obviously very influenced the Ottoman architecture, um, which was really developed by Mimar Sinan in the uh, 16th century. Uh, and that was very much derived from the Hagia Sophia, um, which was, yes, it's an early Byzantine building. Um, so, yes, it is. There, is. there are very strong Byzantine influences in that. What I like very much about the uh, Sharjah Mosque, if you go inside, um, it's, it's not over-decorated. It actually have, it captures, um, the, so you, you become very aware of the space as well as the decoration. The decoration highlights where it needs to highlight. And I think that's, that was something that Sinan was particularly good at. All right, there's another, we, we'll, uh, we'll take three more questions. Is that one by you, by you Peter? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so uh, uh, there is a question from Azana. She says, uh, what, are your thoughts, uh, what are your thoughts on how Sharjah will balance urbanization as it expands? And is it limited by the original tightness of a planning due to the land sales? Um, I think Sharjah could be, much denser than it is. And um, if you fly over it, as I, I, I did um, a few years ago in a helicopter to, to take photographs of the central area, um, of the old historic area, um, it's quite surprising how much land is still undeveloped in the center. So it still has capacity. One thing I find a little disturbing 
is that in, in, in this very, very short period of time, you know, since Sharjah has really been a modern city, in the last, uh, last 50 years, you know, it's expanding now at an incredible rate into the desert um, and at very low density. And I think in terms of resources, um, that could be very wasteful. And um, it's, uh, uh, apart from the fact that it's destroying, you know, one of the great resources that we have for recreation and clean air, you know, is the desert around us. Um, and if eventually we go and, you know, we spread out and we join up with Dade, for instance, and then with Corfa Khan, you know, that would, would seem to be very, uh, not a very good thing to do. So there's one area I, I, I feel quite critical of, of the way the urban, uh, urban expansion is going. We've got a lot of urban sprawl where we could be de rather densifying uh, the city um, and making it, a, you know, a, a better place to live in. Uh, Melissa asks, uh, uh, she says, uh, Sharjah has a very distinct architectural character, which I love and identify with. I am curious to know what you think about all the upcoming new developments, which are ultra modern and to an extent Western. And amidst this modernization, are there any design characteristics specific to Sharjah you would like to see preserved? Um. I think Sharjah can accommodate both. Uh, I think what's very what's very interesting is that the government administrative buildings, you know, have have their language. The commercial buildings have another language. I think the secret to it is that is again is about respect between the two, um, and it's it's partly about scale. You know, there's a bank building in the middle of the historic area that goes up with the four wind towers on top you know, 30 floors or whatever it is, that's completely out of scale with everything else around there. That's a real shame. Um, the other buildings are 10 or 11 stories. You know, we can, the old build those, that's the row of, of commercial buildings that were built um, in, at the end of the 60s. You know, and they, they have a scale to them. And again, I go back to, in terms of urban design, I think what's really important and can link all this is the way we design our streets. And that very often, you know, the best architecture is not necessarily the building, it's the space between them. It's how we handle the space between the buildings and the interface between buildings and the street. Um, and, uh, you know, is it nice to walk around? Now, the, all that effort that I tried to show was put into the, make the souk a comfortable place without air conditioning it um, and stitching it together with a, with a roof and a, a new floor. Um, it's, it's the space between buildings that really will make the town successful at the end and not just handing it over all over to the motor car. So, you know, we need, to, we need also to look at strategies for public transport uh, and moving people in the shade and people can move around comfortably um, rather than having to leave a building, jump into a motor car uh, to go to the next building. Um, uh, we mustn't, we, cities that are dominated by the motor car are not particularly nice places to live. Um, and they're big decisions that have to be made and obviously very important in terms of sustainability, climate change, global warming, and creating these urban heat sinks, you know, which are much hotter than the environment around them. Uh, Ferishita uh, says the merging of a traditional and modern architecture in the souk is very interesting and leading to a fusion design, benefiting from old knowledge, wisdom, and adapting it to a modern standard. Such a fusion strategies could be a cost-effective way forward improving outdated standards without erasing the history, but continuously building on it and embracing each phase. Do you have any advice for improvement project in the future, basically maintaining their own character while updating the technology and comfort for the residents? I'm not sure I have any advice. Uh, I'd, I think it's important that we recognize our old building stock and that we don't just demolish it when it stops being fashionable or it's gone through its first life cycle. You know, if, if we did that in our old cities in Europe um, and elsewhere, you know, we would have just modern cities. We wouldn't have cities that have the character and, and the sense of place and the strong identity that just take, for instance, Paris and London, Berlin, you know, if you take you know, Barcelona, you know, 
it's really important that we utilize our building stock and we re recycle it and we use it in different ways and we improve it we make it we better insulate it we um, improve the services and uh, its environmental efficiency and its space efficiency but we shouldn't just knock it down you know i, I remember a few years ago reading that dubai was in introducing a law where um, any building of 30 years old would be demolished um, that's crazy you know that, that that's not that doesn't make sense you know when you invest in a building um, it potentially can last hundreds of years if it's cared for um, you know in Europe we go and visit and the buildings we like to go and visit are, are those that are some of them extremely old look at the Alhambra in in Granada if that had been knocked down after 30 years you know what we'd be looking at something very different so I'm not sure I have advice it's um, I love old buildings. I, uh, I like all buildings, not like modern buildings and old buildings, but I, you know, it's, it's, the, it's always exciting when, you know, when you see an, an architect who's, who's done something really good with an old building. Uh, for instance, I, I, the island of museums in Berlin, you know, where you've got new and old juxtaposed um, in very exciting ways that, that again, make you smile, make, uplift you as a human being. Last, que uh, last question, Peter, it's from Andrew. He says, which is your favorite part of Sharjah, including the East Coast? So what is my? Favorite part of Sharjah, including the East Coast. My favorite part of Sharjah. Um, that's difficult. And, uh, one particular spot I really love is Wadi Halu. I think it's, it's very beautiful. It's just an area of small farms um, and a very rich landscape. Um, yeah, no difficult. Uh, I like, uh, I've, and I, I suppose that I really have got to like the uh, Madame, the edge of the Madame Plain between uh, uh, Fossil Rock and going Jebel Fire, you know, that's such, you get this mix of landscapes. You know, on the one side you have the sand dunes you, and they, they go up the side of the mountain up the, up the side of Jebel Fire. Uh, and then on the other side, you have a gravel plain, a very different landscape. And, they, and of course, where you've got these juxtapositions of very different landscapes, um, you know, water was, was doing very special things. So you also get some fantastic prehistory going back, you know, 100,000 years. Um, so that's why Sharjah has this in incredible archaeology. So maybe, maybe my favourite place would be, you know, where, where between that area between uh, the Geology Museum at Buhais and uh, the Archaeology Museum at uh, close to Fossil Rock. That's all then. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time and for uh, this amazing lecture. It was very interesting and informative. And thank you all for attending and for the time you've given uh, us to uh, uh, join the meeting and uh, listen to the lecture. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>